Hey y'all, how's it going? Welcome to another video. I'm just gonna warn you now, the visuals in this in this video are gonna just be horrible. I poured a gallon of diesel on this wood trying to get it to light, but it's been raining for days. I thought maybe I could get it hot enough to burn, but it just never did. So we've got this smoking, stinking fire. But, you know, it is kind of the way it is. Hey, before we uh, get going on this, I wanna read you a comment I had on a video not too long ago. And this woman writes, I'm 71 years young, and I just want to let you know that you are truly loved in this household. My granddaughter and I love listening to your videos. We pop popcorn, tighten our weave, which she loves it when you say that, and settle in for a new story. We love the long ones because we can usually finish our popcorn. If it's a short one, we just go back to some of the older ones until our popcorn is gone. If it's a school night, we'll hold off until Friday night. And boy, let me tell you, that's the hardest thing for me to do. She makes me promise every time to wait for her, and she knows that I would never break my promise. Hope you and your family are well. God bless you all. That is why I do these videos. That's why I do these videos. And I just want to tell her thank you so much. I recorded this I recorded this video last night. I tried to get it up for Friday night, but I just didn't make it. It got too late. So, ma'am, here is your video for you and your granddaughter and everyone else, and we hope y'all enjoy it. All right, let's roll with the video. All right, here we go. Mama told me, girl, don't you see? There ain't nobody gonna take from me. Daddy said to live your life. This is an email I got from Paul. Paul lives in the United Kingdom, and he's actually sent me a couple of stories, and I'm going to share both of them with you because I think they're interesting. They're not Bigfoot stories. He writes, I started hunting and fishing when I was 10 years old with an uncle here in the UK, and I've hunted and fished worldwide ever since. Being in the outdoors is me at my happiest, even if I don't get anything. I enjoy stalking deer, working the land, and being selective as to what I harvest. Everything I harvest is for the pot, except for the foxes and the rats. As a hunter, I believe in selective and ethical hunting. And when I do take a life, I always give the best I can for a quick, clean kill. I live in England, but most of my hunting was in Scotland on syndicate land leased from a tree plantation company. The plantation consisted of mature trees with fire breaks, clear fell, and new plantation with gravel tracks. We were allowed to have a static caravan on site. Americans call these camping trailers. The leased area was 1,500 acres, but next to this was a further 1,200 acres of woodland and farmland that was run by a local, and they shot for driven pheasant. The agreement with the gamekeeper was if we helped keep the foxes down on the chute by lamping at night, we would get an invite on the chute for the end of the season on Keeper's Day. One weekend in early October 2004, I arranged for myself and a friend to go deer stalking. I was all packed up and ready to go when my friend called me and said he couldn't come due to a family emergency. So it was just me and the dog, which was fine. I set off later than I was hoping for, and on the way up to Scotland, I got held up even further with roadworks. The five-hour drive turned into six hours, and when I got to the trailer in the woodland, it was getting on for about 9.30 p.m., and I was losing light. There was not enough light left to start an evening stalk, so I made a meal, and I thought I would drive the plantation next door after midnight and see if I could nail some foxes whilst lamping. For all you rednecks out there, lamping is what we call shining or spotlight. But he's doing it legally for foxes and predators, which is cool. We can't even do that. We can't even shine a light in a field at night and the game warden will be on us like white on rice. But anyway, I digress. It's shining for all the rednecks. Just after midnight, I put the dog in the back of the Land Rover, set the spotting lamp up, and headed off with my 243. I arrived at the gate of the plantation and unlocked the gate and I drove in. It was strange because I remember a funny feeling when I opened the gate. I wasn't sure what it was, but something didn't feel right. 
I drove along the mature woodland, and I looked down a fire break and noticed a bright light in the sky. It was very bright. I thought it was a satellite off in the sky. This was looking out the right side of my car at my 3 o'clock. I carried on past the mature trees, and I turned right down a track that opened on some clear fell. I expected to see the light in front of me, but it was still at 90 degrees to my right, which was strange. I carried down the track for about three to 400 yards, and I stopped. I looked at the light, and it was still there, just hanging in the sky. I put my Zeiss binoculars on it, and it was hard to look at due to the brightness. The thing was a bright silver. It looked like a cylinder on its end, like you would put a Coke can on a table. I put the rangefinder on it, and it was 650 yards from me. It must have been 25 feet long and maybe 10 feet in diameter and hanging about 200 feet off the ground. I could see the trees illuminated by its brightness below. I carried on down the track and I turned right again. I was now driving behind it. I stopped and put the rangefinder on it again and it was now at 500 yards. This thing just hung there. I don't know what it was, but it made no noise and it didn't seem to move. I was mesmerized by it. Fear took over, and I thought it best to move along. I floored it down the track. The road curved at the end and joined the original track that I came in on. I looked out the window, and it was still hanging there. I had driven all the way around it, and it was always on the right side of the vehicle. I drove back to my syndicate area, and I went to bed in the caravan. In the morning, I drove to the next door plantation again about 9 a.m., and I looked at the area again and saw no sign of it. I drove the same route and stopped in the same places, and I never saw anything strange. A few months later, I told a friend about it, and after he finished laughing at me and saying it was the moon or a planet, he asked me why I didn't go closer to it or why I didn't take a shot at it with my rifle. At the time, that never occurred to me to even think of doing that, and in hindsight, I wouldn't have done so anyway. It's kind of drummed into me always to know what I'm shooting at and never to aim or discharge a rifle above a backstop. To this day, I don't know what it was. Primeval fear kept me from getting closer and told me to leave, and I think a deep unknown sixth sense told me something wasn't right when I arrived. I don't know if it was my eyes playing tricks, but I did get hits with the rangefinder, so this thing must have been solid and reflective. It seemed to emit a light, but it didn't have any lights. I've never seen anything like it again, nor do I really want to. It would be interesting if any of your followers have encountered anything that fits this description. So guys, if you've seen a cylinder-shaped, bright, silvery something or another in the air, comment below. Tell Paul what's going on or tell him what you've seen. I don't know. That's interesting stuff to me. I love these UFO things. I've just started. <laughs> I posted it on Facebook. I bought the Project Blue Book series that, that the History Channel put out. I'm actually watching it on Amazon, and it is awesome. It is so cool. And it's the same kind of thing that Paul's talking about here. People are seeing these weird things and even encountering creatures that aren't of this world. And it's... Uh, it's really cool. And the theme of it is how people, when they come forward, are bastardized and ridiculed for coming forward. There are even scenes in the show where it's like the mob gathers and comes after the people. It's so weird. It's I just didn't know that ever happened. I knew you got ridiculed, but I didn't know the mob got after you. But Paul's got another thing he wanted to share, and I thought this was really good just as good as his story. And here's what he writes. I wanted to give you one more short story that isn't a Bigfoot story, and it's not really a UFO story. This is about people who tell about what they have seen. I've noticed the amount of decent people who are ridiculed for telling the truth about what they saw, regardless of whether it can be explained or not. A lot of these people are well-respected, professional people who have their lives really affected by simply telling the truth. And that's what this story is about. Many years ago, I used to shoot wildfowl and game with a really nice guy. He had a great sense of humor, and the banter that he gave and was able to take was legendary. 
He worked for a local farmer and also was a part-time truck driver, and he worked for various haul firms in the southeast of the United Kingdom. He was ex-army and served with his original regiment in Germany and Northern Ireland, then needed more of a challenge and went for the parachute regiment. You have to be a tough bastard to get in that also, and you also have to be a bit mad. This was in the early 1980s. In 1982, he found himself on the way to the South Atlantic on a troop ship with his regiment in May of 1982 and found himself in full combat at Goose Green during the Falklands War. After he left the Army, he returned back to rural life, settled down, and married, and they had a child. He was well-known in the community and very well-liked and was the kind of guy who would help anyone out. Over a couple of beers one evening, he told me this story and how it affected his life, his work, and his marriage. In the summertime in the late 1980s, he was trucking freshly harvested peas with another guy in another truck. It was early morning and they were driving through a rural area in Suffolk and heading for a pea processing factory. As they drove down the quiet country roads, the sun started to rise and in the pink and blue sky, they saw two black triangles. They seemed to just hang silhouetted in the sky. He drew them and they were isosceles triangles. He said you could even see the heat haze coming off of them. He got on his CB to the other driver and said, do you see them? What the hell are they? The other driver said, screw this, and they both floored the trucks and didn't stop until they reached the truck stop 20 miles away. He said they both felt shook up and told other truckers what they had seen. This was a big mistake. At no point did they ever say UFO or spaceship or aliens. They just described what they had seen in the sky that morning, and they received a fair amount of ridicule, and it didn't stop there. It spread like wildfire, and it never ended. They both were accused of drinking on the job and being mentally unbalanced. They lost work through the ordeal. They just weren't hired by any of the haulage companies. Every time he went into town, someone would draw an alien face on his car in the dust or whistle the Close Encounters theme. It was the same in the local pub. You would think that a tough guy like him could take it and that it could only go on for so long, but it stopped being banter or a joke and it simply turned into harassment. One day he had had enough and he punched one of his hecklers. Unfortunately, that got him his shotgun certificate revoked over it. I can't stress how constant it was. The other driver moved away because of the bullying also. In 1991, when the first Gulf War started, it suddenly became clear to him what he had actually seen. On television, the United States Air Force rolled out the F-117 stealth fighter. What he and the other driver had seen was these aircraft coming in to land at an air base in Suffolk. Even when he explained to people that's what he had seen, it never mattered and the harassment never stopped. I last saw him in the mid-1990s when he was running aid out for the United Nations to the Balkans War. I heard he met a Bosnian woman who was from Germany and moved out there after the war. He was a good friend and a great guy and really didn't deserve what he got for simply telling the truth. Paul signs off here. Paul, I know I have never experienced that kind of harassment or I catch some crap when Bigfoot comes up in a discussion. You know, people always get that little grin and I do too. I laugh with them and I make it fun. There's no sense in taking all this stuff too serious. But that's quite different than being harassed by a bunch of blokes in your town who just hammer you constantly about something that you talked about. And you never even, he never even said they were UFOs or aliens or spacecraft or anything. He just said he saw triangles in the sky. So I think here's the moral to this. Be careful what you tell people. I, I, I know it seems, and I know there are a lot of people out there, you know, trying to, encouraging people to come forward and all but I, I would encourage you to think it through and i would also encourage you to maybe leave your name off of it because i it saying your name in in one of these stories does not help advance 
the Bigfoot calls. It just doesn't. It just puts your reputation in jeopardy, in my opinion. And so, you know, I don't ever read, I don't ever even read last, na- last names. I'm not going to put anybody in that position. If they say they don't want their name used, I don't even say their first name. But usually if they give me both of them, I'll just, like this this fellow here that wrote me, his name is Paul. I know his last name, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. But anyway, I, it's a great couple of stories there and good insights and good anecdotes for people to hear. And I loved it. Paul, thanks for sending it. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, man. Here's an email from Edward, and here's what Edward writes. This took place in late 2018. It started in deep fall and continued into late December. I live in northeastern Ohio, and my dogs were going ballistic every night for over two months in late 2018. I had seen signs of the presence of something but was unsure of what it was, and to be honest, I really wasn't paying attention and it didn't occur to me at the time what I was seeing. I was mowing the grass in the very late fall of 2018 when I passed a large matted down spot in the tall grass. It was probably about 15 feet in diameter. I didn't see any tracks or trails leading into or out of it, so I brushed it off as deer habitat. Every single night, within five minutes of the lights getting turned off, my German shepherds would go to the door and peer out and growl and start barking. That went on for what seemed like it was going to be an eternity, and I didn't think I was ever going to get any sleep. I never heard any sounds, and I don't have a sense of smell. It's a hereditary thing. My grandfather couldn't smell, and my brother's daughter can't either, so I didn't smell anything, and winter was kicking in. It was getting cold. The dogs still weren't letting up, and during the daytime, I kept a pretty good eye on them because we have had a bunch of missing cats and dogs in this area recently. The same thing happened back in the 80s, and a couple of guys were caught stealing people's pets and selling them on the market for animal food and all kinds of nasty stuff. So that's what I figured was going on. I was very watchful, and I would call them in several times throughout the day, and in the evening, just to keep an eye on them. Then I saw a video where a man's dog became the target of a Sasquatch because the dog was constantly giving away its position. And something inside me clicked, and I just knew there was more to this than just a small herd of deer sleeping there and traversing back and forth. So I decided to load up a rifle and leave it by my bed until I managed to get rid of whatever was coming around. My wife insisted that it was a coyote because the year before we had a rather large one come into the area in broad daylight and it wasn't at all afraid of us. The rifle I was using had a red laser sight on the end of it and a dot sight up top for quick tactics and a pinch. Then on December 2nd, 2018, around 2 a.m., I turned out the lights and I laid down in bed to wait, and sure enough, within minutes, my dogs rushed to the door and started barking like crazy. But this time, they were growling like I've never heard them growl before, so I knew something was out there. I sat up partway in bed with the rifle in hand, and I waited and watched, and sure enough, in the midst of that cold wind and rainstorm, I saw an almost man-shaped, very dark outline figure step quietly and smoothly up to the kennel fence and stand there for a moment. Our kennel is six feet tall, and this creature was a good two and a half feet taller and was about four feet wide at the shoulders. I couldn't make out any details, just its basic shape. I think we call those blob squatches. I moved to put the rifle up to my shoulder, and it obviously saw me because it backed off into the darkness again right away, but still silently and really smoothly, almost like it was floating. It rained like the days of Noah for a couple of days, and I never thought to even look for prints in the mud, but I'm pretty sure there weren't any after the heavy rains anyway. Well, it's not much of an encounter, but still enough to make me sleep with a rifle within arm's reach. Not much puts fear into me, and this Squatch didn't either, but it probably would have if things would have gotten ugly, and I would be reporting a dead Sasquatch because I won't miss when it comes to protecting my family. 
and my dogs are like my kids. I love them that much, so they get the same protection from me as my son and wife would. Edward, that's a cool story. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's a, uh, you know, just seeing a figure out there in the rain. Whew, man, that gives me the willies. And, it, and it, apparently it was close enough where you could tell it was taller than the fence and how wide it was. Anyway, that's a great story, buddy. I appreciate you sending it. Thanks. Here's an email from Ted I actually got recently, and he writes, uh, I've been listening to your Bigfoot stories and enjoying them immensely. Thank you. Thank you very much. I take special interest in the stories here in Mississippi. I was born and raised down here on the coast near Pascagoula, and now I live on five acres here in Moss Point, Mississippi, in an area known as Helena, which is out in the country. I've been an outdoorsman all my life. I'm 57 years old, and I've been in the woods since I was a child. My grandfather had a camp up at Creole Bayou, deep in the Pascagoula Swamp, just off the Pascagoula River. It's only accessible by boat. After his retirement from the U.S. Navy, we would spend many nights at his camp hunting and fishing and just enjoying life, and there wasn't hardly a weekend that went by that I wasn't with him. I remember one Saturday morning getting up and going out of the cabin and sitting down by Papa by the fire that he already had going around 5 a.m., and he was drinking coffee. He was being unusually quiet. When I asked what our plans were for the day, he replied, shh, listen, boy. Off in the distance, I could hear what sounded like people talking in a foreign voice. It was pitch black dark, and it was very still, and a light fog hung close to the ground. No other sounds or the usual owls, bugs, or frogs could be heard at all. Only the faint chatter is the only way I know to explain it of voices down in the swamp behind his camp. We sat and listened for, I guess, about another five minutes when I whispered, What is that, Papa? He whispered back to me, It's just them old harpies arguing over breakfast. The hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I got instant chicken skin when he said that. Me, only being 12 years old at the time, I had often heard him talk about the harpies that lived behind his camp, but I thought, me being only 12 years old at the time, I had often heard him talking about the harpies that lived behind his camp, but I only thought that he was joking with me, as he always did, but this time, when he said that he was very serious and didn't crack a smile, I knew he was serious. I can still see his face in the glow of that campfire and hear those voices in my head to this day. I wish to this day I would have asked him more about the things that live behind the camp and if he had ever seen them. After he passed away, my father sold the camp, and since then, many other people have purchased property up there and built more camps, so it's not nearly as secluded as it used to be. I still occasionally will ride by there in my boat, and the property has all grown over and the camp has fallen in. Apparently, nobody ever used the camp or has rebuilt on the property. I have recently listened to recordings of what seems to be Sasquatch conversations, and the recordings I have listened to sound very similar to what we were hearing that morning at my grandfather's camp years ago. At present, I go camping once every month, rain or shine, sleet or snow, deep in the DeSoto National Forest, but I have yet to hear anything like that ever again. Do you have any reports of sightings or sounds from DeSoto Forest? I camp all over the National Forest from south end up to the north end for the last two years, and I found no sounds of a Bigfoot anywhere. Although I have just recently started actually looking for signs since I started listening to your posts on YouTube, please email me back with any information you may have, for I've grown quite interested in this topic. You have my full permission to use this email and its contents as you see fit. Thank you for what you're doing, and keep up the good work. Signed, Ted. Ted, thank you. I, I've never heard Bigfoot called a harpy. I, matter of fact, I've never heard that term. And I think I, it seems like I should have, but I just haven't. That's a new term to me. But I'm guessing that's what your granddaddy was, your papa was was calling the Bigfoot, the harpies. That's fascinating. And you know, those old guys, I, I know, I know how a young boy looks up to his big, strong grandfather and his father. I know exactly what that feels like, and I can see his grandfather sitting there in the glow of that fire and being real serious 
about him keeping quiet and listening to that chatter off in the distance. And I bet that would spook a, spook a little kid. Anyway, it's a wonderful story, Ted. Thanks for sending it in. I really appreciate you, buddy. This person wants to keep their name undisclosed, and that's what I'm going to do. But here's what she writes. I don't know if you take alien abduction stories, but I'm compelled to tell my story to you. I think there are many stories out there, but they don't dare talk about it. Anyway, here goes mine. Let me start to tell you that I was an RN for 35 years. I was an educator and a director. I lived in Florida for many years and got my nursing education there. Back in my college days, it wasn't uncommon to go on a date and then go parking on a deserted country road. In those days, it was just a big kiss fest. After a while, I had to step into the bushes and use the restroom. Eventually, he took me home. He kissed me goodnight, and I got ready and went to bed. No drama at all so far. I woke up the next morning when I was getting dressed, and I noticed a deep wound in my right hip. It was one and a half inches deep. It had a dark ring around the entrance. I could put my little finger down in it almost to my second knuckle. Normally, when you get a wound like this, it bleeds and it hurts. It usually gets infected. It drains until healed up, and then it leaves a scar. But not this wound. It didn't hurt at all, and it didn't bleed. It didn't get it infected, and it never drained. I eventually healed up. It did not leave a scar. I didn't tell anyone for years, except one time I told a lady doctor about it, and her eyes got really big, and she freaked out a little. She told me that it was impossible. Well, impossible or not, it happened. I'm retired now, and throughout the years, I've had occasional visions of a white alien face staring down on me while I lay on a stretcher. I was watching one of the alien abduction TV shows a couple of months ago, and in that episode, this poor guy was being tormented by aliens flying around his property. They brought in a hypnotist to uncover his memories. He reported that he had been abducted at one time or another. I thought that this is a good idea. I wanted to get to the bottom of what happened to me that night. I had a friend who was a psychologist, and she was trained to do hypnosis. I was a bit scared, but I went through with it anyway. I was taken back to the scene of that night. I was walking back to the car after spending a few minutes in the bushes, and suddenly a clear white light came down on me and pulled me up into a spacecraft. When I got into the craft, there were two tall white aliens to greet me. It was small in there, and to my right, there were controls to the craft. In the back was a white bench with what looked like specimen tubes lined up, and in the middle was a narrow white bed. One of the whites made it known to me that I was to lie on the white bed. I protested, but I lay down as directed. He took a green glowing stick that looked like a pencil, pulled down the corner of my pants, and on my left hip, pierced my skin with it. Things got fuzzy after that, but I asked him why he was doing that. He telepathically said to me, DNA. That totally freaked me out as to why they wanted my DNA. I will leave you to speculate why this alien wanted my DNA. I have my own theories. I would like to say that that was the end of the story, but it's not. When I was in my 50s, I woke up one morning and I noticed that the outer eyelashes on both eyes were neatly clipped off at an angle. The shortest cutoff lashes started at the outer corner of my eye. The cut angle up to the lashes in the middle. This made a nice triangle cut of my outer lashes on both eyes. I thought, what in the world would cause this? I then remembered that when doctors want the eye wide open, they would put a clamp on the outer lashes that could potentially break off in the same pattern. All I could think is that they came back for a checkup. May I add that I was not scared of the whites during my hypnosis. They seemed familiar. I do know that me and both of my sisters were terrified of aliens at night when we were little girls. 
Well, that's the end of my true story for now. I don't know if this is appropriate for you or not. Use it if you like. Please don't use my name. I don't need any men in black coming to bother me. Well, man, that's a, it's absolutely appropriate. Uh, we love these UFO stories and these alien abduction stories. I don't know. I'm just now starting to scratch the surface and do a little reading and trying to take in some information on this alien thing. I'll tell you why, and I may have mentioned it before. I started watching this Project Blue Book, the, the History Channel series. That is an awesome, at least it's an entertaining series, and it's really piqued my interest. Even though we love these encounters, I know that they're tough on you, so that's not what we're that's not what I'm saying. But we, I really enjoyed reading this, and I thought it was real descriptive. And so thank you very much for sending it. Here's another story that the uh, person doesn't want their name disclosed. And again, that's no problem. And here's what she writes. H hold on a minute. Betsy, I've been petting you all day. Good grief. Get out from under my chair. Go on. Go. Go. Uh, sorry about that. <clears throat> I would like to share with you an experience I had in the early 1980s while driving home to Hendersonville, North Carolina from Asheville, North Carolina. I would like to preface my story by saying I have never taken psychedelic drugs and nor have I ever been a drinker. I was completely sober when this happened. Just before daybreak on a warm summer morning, I was driving south on I-26 from Asheville, North Carolina. I had just dropped my husband off at work and was heading home to Hendersonville. The morning light was still low and it was a bit foggy, so I was driving cautiously in the right lane. As I was passing the Asheville Airport exit, I saw a large bright light high in the sky coming down vertically directly in front of me. I remember thinking, that airplane is off course and headed in the wrong direction. It looks like it's trying to make a landing on the interstate. I pulled over next to the guardrail and turned my radio volume down low. As the light came closer, it stopped and hovered just above the interstate about 150 yards away from me. Then the craft slowly made a sharp right turn and moved to the east of me to hover about 150 feet above the dairy farm below. This property is now the golf course at the Asheville Airport. The craft was only about 50 yards from the guardrail now, and where I sat in my car, I was mesmerized. I rolled down my window and turned off my car. I could hear the noise of the spacecraft pulsing and whirring. It did not look or sound like anything like the airplanes I had seen and heard flying at the Asheville Airport over the years. The craft was flat on the bottom and domed, an upside-down saucer shape. The craft was huge, at least the length of a football field, and as it pulled alongside me on my right, the bright light on the front of the craft was behind my view inside the car as it illuminated the pasture and the trees beneath the craft. I could also see that there were three smaller lights on the side of the craft that I was now facing, a red light flanked by two small blue lights located at the bottom of the disc. I could also see faint lights of the Asheville Airport runway in the background. I remember thinking it must be some type of top-secret aircraft being tested by the Air Force. I got out of the car and I walked around to the back of my Camaro over to the guardrail. I stood there for some time just staring at it and trying to rationalize what I was seeing. Why had the airport control not called the Highway Patrol? I thought to myself, why is no one stopping? Why is there no response from police or emergency agencies? All of these questions ran through my mind as I stood there for several minutes staring at the craft and waiting to see what it would do next. I felt like I was in some kind of a trance or hypnotic state. That was the last thing I remember until 45 minutes later when I found myself sitting in my car with both windows rolled up, the radio was blaring and the car was running. The heat was on high and I was drenched in sweat. By then, it was full daylight and cars were zooming past me. I was dazed and confused as I drove home emotionally shaken, crying, and generally terrified. 
I was also in intense pain, so I went to bed immediately and I slept for several hours due to the stress. It felt like I had been raped and the pain in my lower abdomen was excruciating. I never said anything to my husband or anyone else for that matter for many years until now. About a month later, after this incident, I had a very painful miscarriage. Oh, oh, it just breaks my heart. I don't know what happened during these 45 minutes of lost time, but I believe I was taken on board and I was impregnated. I will never know for sure. I did not see or come in contact with any creatures that I know of because I don't have any memory of the 45 minutes. But this I do know. Whatever happened to me was against my will, and it was very painful. It has taken me many years to get my head wrapped around what actually happened to me. It has not been until the advent of the internet and YouTube that I have come to understand there are others who have had worse experiences with abductions. Can I prove that I was abducted? No. But I do know this. If this was an alien craft, the creatures inside it were malevolent and very dangerous. I believe they are demonic in nature, and for anyone to think that aliens are here to help us is naive. There are created beings in this world that mean to harm us. Perhaps they are the type of Nephilim spoken of in the Bible. Whether your listeners believe my story is irrelevant to me. I don't have a dog in this hunt. I just want to share this with others and let them know if they have had a similar experience, they are not alone. Just be aware that these beings are not like E.T. is portrayed in the film. They are evil, and if you have any contact with them, plead the blood of Jesus and command them to leave. Ma'am, that's a heart heartbreaking story. I, I just, oh, I don't know. Something about uh, miscarriages and l little babies and children just, oh, it just kills me. That's that's a horrifying experience, and I know it's a horrible memory. And I've actually heard stories like this before. I, I, I haven't done any stories on this channel about it, and I was a little reluctant to do this because I, I, know, I know younger people listen in with their families. But I don't think this was too explicit. I think this just, uh, you wanted to tell your story and I wanted to get it out there for you. So I, I hope you're doing well these days and I hope things are good. And I hope you've got your mind adjusted to, and, and I hope you're having a happy life. But thank you so much for the story. And I know we all appreciated you sharing it with us. Thank you. Here's an email from Kelly, and I, I, she doesn't think this is worthy of a cryptid channel. And it's really not about a cryptid, but it is a great story. It's just, oh, man, you, you guys are so nice to send me these. Even though they're not about Bigfoot or whatever, they're just so good. I love reading them. I just sat here and read through this, and I was like gripping gripping the, the arms on my chair going, what's going to happen next? So let's get into it. She writes, my name is Kelly. And I'm from England, and I'm a regular listener to your show. I have a true story, but I'm not sure if it will interest you. It isn't about Bigfoot nor Dogman. To be honest, it does not even involve a cryptid, and I'm not sure you could class it as paranormal or supernatural. But I will let you decide on that yourself. First, let me tell you a little about myself. I'm a 47-year-old woman, and I live in Lincoln with my husband. The story did not happen in Lincoln, but in Manchester, where I used to live before I married. I lived on a rather large estate back in 2002 when this strange incident occurred, and I had lived in that area since 1972. It was the beginning of July, and we had just had the hottest day of the year. It had been around 94, and the night was so humid it was still in the 80s. I knew I would not be able to sleep, although I was due in for work at 9 a.m. the next morning, and I stayed up watching television until 2 a.m. When I retired to bed, it was boiling hot in the room, and I opened the window as wide as I could to let some air inside, but there wasn't any. Sadly, we don't have air conditioners here, and the air outside was as warm as that within the room. 
I dressed lightly and I chose to sleep on top of the covers, but as hard as I tried, I couldn't sleep. And I did not even feel tired, but I knew without any sleep I would pay for it the next day at work. I clock watched instead as I tossed and turned, and then 2 a.m. changed into 3 a.m. and then 4 a.m. It was just far too warm to sleep, so I took a book from my bookshelf and I began to read, hoping that I would eventually drift off to sleep. There was not a sound from anywhere coming through the window as I read, and then about 4.30 a.m., I heard the clopping sound, clip-clop, clip-clop. My first thought was, who is riding a horse at this time of the morning? The clip-clopping noise continued, so I put my book down and I leaned out to look through my window. It was daylight, and from my home, I could see either end of the street that I lived on and the main road that it attached to. The clip-clop sound grew louder, and then in the distance on the main road came a figure. I could not see them clearly, only the top of their head over the distant hedges, but it was a woman. I was sure of it, and she was wearing heels, and that is what was making the clip-clop noise. There was no traffic at the time in the morning, and it was a Tuesday, so I wondered why someone was out so early. I popped my head back into the room so she would not see me spying on her, and as she turned the corner, I was amazed to see that she was wearing a winter jacket with a hood pulled up and all that heat. She was also wearing trousers and what looked like old-fashioned hobnailed boots, which still made the loud clip-clop sound. The jacket had the old-style wooden toggles on the front to tie it up, and I stood back in the shadows watching her, thinking that she must be slightly mad to be dressed for winter after the hottest day of the year. I observed her, and she drew level with my house, clip-clopping along. She was side on to me with her head down looking at the ground, so all I could see was her hood, and then she suddenly stopped abruptly. She turned and looked directly up at me. This caused me to take a sharp intake of breath and step backwards. How did she know that I was there, I thought. I remember her face well from what I could see of it under her hood. It was pale like alabaster, and she had dark eyes and a thin mouth that remained closed. Everything about her was off-kilter to me, and the hairs on the back of my neck were standing on end. I thought, what am I doing stepping away from the window? It was still wide open, and I thought, if anyone is weird here, it's her. So I stepped back to the window, and she was gone. All this occurred in seconds, and seeing as I had heard her approaching for the last five minutes with her loud footwear, if she had run off or walked, I would have heard it. I knew all my neighbors well, and she wasn't one of them, so she had not skipped into the houses. Plus, they all had iron gates that made a loud noise as you opened them. I looked out of the window the entire length of the street, left and right, but she was gone. I thought I had spooked her, and she ran into the garden to hide. I would have heard that clip-clop of heels, though, on the pavement. I stood at the window until 5.30 a.m. in case she was hiding somewhere, but I never saw her again. As I stood observing and slightly baffled at the window, a cat came from the left of the street walking along and another from the right, and they met and sat side by side where the woman had stood when she turned to look up at me. It was so weird. Cats usually fight, and these two were not known to me as any of the neighborhood cats either. I stood watching the road with the window shut, even in the heat. I had images of her flying through my window to get me, so I slammed it shut and watched through the glass. The whole episode creeped me out. I could not sleep at all that night, and I went to work a few hours later. I told a few family members, and they thought it strange, but they had no ideas. I wondered if the lady had maybe a skin problem, hence why she was covered over, but why would you wear the heaviest clothes in that heat? Plus, it still did not answer where she suddenly disappeared to silently. I suppose that will remain a mystery. I moved out in 2012, and the only time I ever saw and heard anything was back in 2002, but it has stuck in my mind as odd all these years later. And if she was real or not, your guess is as good as mine. I don't even know if this story is scary or just perplexing, and I was most definitely not dreaming. I know, as I never slept that night, and on hot evenings afterwards, I'll always keep the window closed and endured the heat. 
As I finished typing this, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up again, and I turned around to check that she wasn't standing there. How foolish is that? LOL. Anyway, I love the channel and keep up the good work. Kelly, I love that story. I, You know, it's the way you wrote it. It's the way you wrote it, ma'am. I mean, you just did a great job. You guys, if you think about these stories and you take real events and you describe them really well and you know where to put the suspense and you know how to structure your paragraphs and sometimes it takes writing it two or three times. But when you do, you you guys pop out some great stories. And I love this. Kelly, thank you so much for sending it. It is absolutely, it will absolutely fit on this channel. And it's going in this video. Thanks, Kelly. All the way in the UK. All right. Thank you all for hanging with me this long. I hope um, the 71-year-old woman and her granddaughter enjoyed this video. And I hope it was long enough that you got to finish your popcorn. Otherwise, I'm going to see you guys on the next video. I hope y'all have a good weekend, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks.